a very good afternoon to everyone and a warm welcome for joining this session. It's a pleasure for me and my team to be here and present a topic on eBPF, basically eBPF powered observability for sustainable computing. And the topic revolves around like how we can leverage eBPF to, uh, and take a step towards the sustainable computing. Uh, so as we move towards that, I'd just like to bring up a thought that have you ever wondered how the advancement on the uh, the computer science and the technologies that has been taking us forward, solving the complex problems, uh, has been impacting us. While at the one hand, uh, it's helping us to solve complex problems, uh, it's making our day-to-day -day task easier, it's helping us solve the problems which were very difficult and uh, at times were not even feasible for us to solve. But uh, at the same time, uh, we are also facing a challenge where it is having some impact on the networking uh, uh, towards the comp uh, like while we are solving the complex networking, uh, the complex problem statements, it's impacting our uh, environment as well. So, with that, uh, keeping in mind, uh, our topic will revolve around eBPF. And uh, before we move on towards that direction, I'll just have a question: uh, Has anyone heard about eBPF, or how many folks are familiar about the eBPF? So, I think that's a good uh, raise of hands. And for the remaining, I assure you that by the end of 35 to 40 minutes, you will all be taking a considerable amount of knowledge in the eBPF domain and how the use cases that we'll be showcasing will help you to take a step towards sustainable computing. Toward this session, uh, we have four great speakers. Uh, so myself, Paras, Anmol, Samrat, we all are from India. Uh, we all have our specific domains uh, solving problems like complex networking, uh, simplifying or helping people on board from their on-prem or moving towards the cloud. Uh, and then we have Miki, uh, she's an AI consultant based out of Japan, and she'll be taking you towards the AI journey. Uh, the disclaimer I would like to highlight, the content views presented here are the speaker's personal views and we are not representing any organization or the company we are part of. And the agenda basically revolves around these key aspects. So we'll start with the challenges, how the challenges, or what are the challenges that hinders the sustainable computing. Then we'll took a deep dive on the eBPF, and followed by how the eBPF can be leveraged for the observability aspect. Then all these three topics that we've just talked about will be bundled together, and we'll be exploring the additional eBPF use case uh, basically, like we'll be using network anom anomaly detection and one of the AI model, and using that as a use case and uh, bundling everything together. So I'll keep that as a uh, item that my partner will be covering, followed by the key takeaways. Moving forward towards the challenging to practicing sustainable computing. So here are some of the challenges that uh, we have seen often facing. So sometimes it's like we have uh, multiple cloud providers, and each cloud providers have uh, numerous products and services. And in an attempt to move towards the cloud quickly, uh, there are many a times we are over, uh, we are creating more resources than are required to us, although they are not being utilized, but in an attempt to uh, bring our demo or to showcase our learning or build our learning expertise, we are creating more resources which are required, and uh, overall the intent is to have more folks onboarded to have more revenue generated, but at the same time, we have to actually see whether the resources we are bringing up are actually required or how we can use the best of the resources that we have with us. Same thing happens when we are moving towards the second point, which is inefficient hardware and software networking. So we have like, uh, while we have uh, many products and services which can be utilized, to fine tune any use case, but at the same time, knowing that which service suits where is a critical aspect. So we can have like one problem can be solved by many use cases or many product and services, but which one fits where is the important part. Now, as part of the networking uh, domain specifically, we have to be very efficient in terms of how we design a network, how we sneak in different tools in between into different layers, and how we can actually make sure that the packets being transferred uh, can be efficiently handled uh, across the networking layers. Even though we have first and second covered, the third point then emphasizes that the lack of observability and, uh, and the awareness that uh, even though we have metrics, we are not utilizing it at, at its best. 
uh, even uh, sometimes we may have observability. If we have, we are often at times we are only emphasizing on the SLA, SLO, SLI of the specific product and services, but the other matrices we often ignore. So there's like a bunch of set of closed rules that we are aware of, we follow that, and we are not looking into any other matrices that we could actually leverage. And then, uh, and the last, for the second last point uh, basically mentions about the business centricity and staying competitive. And I'll merge it with the fifth point, which is like the rise of energy intensive and AI models. So we have seen that there has been growing demand in terms of how AI ML models can be leveraged. Everyone is moving towards that. Everyone is trying to identify what's best suited for them. People are using them to train their, uh, their workforce. They are using it to train their uh, models in the development environment. They are also moving towards the production usages. But all this is also coming at a cost. So that is uh, while we are looking at the one side, but we are also uh, ignoring the fact that uh, there has been huge increase in the energy consumptions that we should not be ignoring. And these energy uh, consumptions often comes at a cost of something. And this cost, in our case, uh, is basically the environment. The next slide, uh, I'll start with the second point. So the second point basically says awareness about the development and energy efficient computing and AI ML training practices. So basically like we, the need of the R is like we should be aware of how we can make energy efficient computing and AI ML models. How we can make sure that these are better suited our, towards our current complex problems, but at the same time uh, we are not compromising on the other uh, pillars, but that's a topic for some other day. But now I'll move on to the first topic, which is observability for environmental impact. And for that, I'll hand it over to my colleague, uh, who will be taking you to deep towards how this will be a really interesting way forward. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for the, you know, hustle. And uh, my name is Samrat Vidrashi. I work as a cloud engineer. And uh, basically, as Paris mentioned, we'll go through eBPF and then Anmol and Mickey will take you through some of the use cases, uh, how we can use eBPF for observability. Now, eBPF, it has a lot of use cases, but uh, in this talk, we are mainly focusing on observability, but it has use cases uh, you know, throughout networking, security as well which uh, we'll see uh, in, in uh, some time, but uh, the main highlight is observability. And uh, basically, uh, you know, observability was, you know, uh, there, but it was not optimized. And that's why, uh, you know, like eBPF was born, because you would have heard about, uh, uh, you know, sidecar patterns in Kubernetes where you might use some sidecar pattern for like Istio and all for, uh, you know, logging, monitoring, and uh, uh, traceability, but it was a uh, overhead and all, right? So, eBPF basically was born like you do something in the kernel or with the kernel, and then um, it's at the kernel level, and every VM has just one kernel. So, whatever you you do there, the uh, impact will be to all the applications running in the user space. So that's how it is born. Uh, it was born and. Uh, Basically, this is a quote, a very famous quote, and it's like putting uh, JavaScript into the kernel. So basically, I think there were a lot of talks about uh, Linux kernel and what we can do to improve it and how the cycle looks like. It's, you know, so if you have to add any feature to Linux kernel, it like takes years, months, goes through a lot of scrutiny through the community. Uh, and it's a, it's a complex process. And Linux uh, kernel development or programming in itself is very complicated and uh, hard. So it was a high time that, you know, we did something what we did with HTML, uh, where, you know, we extended it with uh, to CSS, JavaScript, and now see the web apps where they have come in 20 years. So something similar eBPF is for the Linux kernel. And uh, it, it's like still in the early phases, but we are getting a lot of tractions. Uh, but uh, eBPF, earlier it was BPPF, uh, which is Berkeley Packet Filter, but the extended in front of that, uh, the E stands for extended. And uh, basically now it has, as I mentioned, use cases across security, uh, observability, and uh, networking. 
And basically what it helps uh, us in doing is you just write a program and uh, you just, uh, you know, so in the back end there are a lot of things happening uh, which I'll dive into uh, in little uh, time, but uh, you can just, uh, you know, take that program and run within the kernel, right? So it's like a plug and play thing. Uh, and, and that makes, uh, you know, the kernel behave in certain way based on whatever uh, hooks you attach that particular program to. So I'll get into hooks, system events and all. But basically, it's like a sandbox program running in its own, uh, you know, isolated environment inside the kernel. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, you know, you don't have to change anything in the application code. Earlier, we would have seen, uh, you know, tools which you have to instrument in the application. But with eBPF, uh, you don't have to do it. So whatever program uh, you write, eBPF program, you just uh, you know, the, the kernel will handle it for you, so it impacts everything running in the user space, right? So if you have hundreds of ports, uh, they all, uh, if, if you instrument something or write an eBPF program for networking or security or logging, uh, right? So it will track everything, uh, you know, from the user space based on the event, right? So that's why it's a little bit simpler than uh, uh, kernel programming. It's it's. Uh, it's still a little bit uh, complex, but you know, simpler than uh, writing the, uh, you know, modifying the kernel. So, uh, coming back to that, uh, I just want to take a moment with this architecture. This is very oversimplified architecture. How it works. So basically, you have the user space, and uh, you know, the kernel, and then we have our hardware, uh, memory, and uh, CPU storage, etc. Right, which in this diagram uh, I haven't shown, but. The kernel is the you know the layer which helps in uh, the communication between the hardware and the user space, right? So uh, basically, earlier it was uh, the kernel is like I think 30 million slide lines of code, and it's very hard to first get a knowledge and then modify it and then uh, you know get it reviewed and then uh, uh, take back to the uh, uh, the final kernel, right? The new version. So it's a very uh, uh, involved cycle. But in this diagram, if you see, you write uh, a C program, and uh, you convert it into bytecode uh, using LLVM or CLang, uh, the, the compiler that we have. And then you load it in the uh, kernel, right? So there are BPF system calls, which happens in the user space. And basically, you load it in the kernel. And you attach it to a hook, uh, right? So it can be whenever a uh, you know, a packet is received, you open a file or close a file. So those are system events. There are a lot of other events as well to which you can attach your eBPF programs. But uh, these are some of the common ones. And uh, once, so whenever, so for example, if you create an eBPF program for, uh, you know, doing something whenever a file is open, so your system event is like opening a file, right? So whenever a file is opened, it is loaded into the kernel dynamically. And what happens is we have something uh, called a verification engine, uh, which is what it does is uh, it takes care of that uh, your eBPF program, uh, you know, doesn't crash. It, it, it uh, you know, comes to a final, uh, uh, like, exit, graceful exit. Otherwise, you know, the whole kernel will uh, crash. So it takes care of all those, uh, you know, small things. And that's how it has become, uh, the, you know, extendable. And then it's executed, and then there's output. Now, there are a lot of things which are not shown in this diagram. There are, like, uh, just-in-time uh, compilers. There are eBPF maps. But I think that's the advanced thing with eBPF. Um, but the output that you're seeing, we have something called eBPF maps. Uh, I think in this diagram in the bottom, uh, you can see that uh, you know we have a verifier, we have just-in-time compiler, and uh, the map. So basically, what map uh, does is uh, it's like a data structure, and it supports a lot of uh, data structures. And whenever uh, so, so what happens is you you want different eBPF programs to communicate with each other, or eBPF program to communicate to the user space. Uh, that's where these uh, maps are used, and uh, uh, you know, so that's why they are very effective. And I think part of the reason of that E is because of these maps. Uh, but uh, these are some of the use cases uh, on the top that you're seeing, and I talked about them briefly. Uh, 
So uh, I think the most common one is cilium that you're seeing, and that's how I got to know about eBPF a couple of years ago when I was working uh, on cilium and what it uh, you know offers. It's a great implementation of eBPF, um, and um, you know it does uh, observability through Hubble. It does networking security as well. So. Uh, we have Catranas also from Facebook. It's a uh, layer four load balancer. Uh, then we have Berkeley, uh, uh, you know, compiler connect collection. You'll see a lot of uh, use cases there uh, of how you can, uh, you know, communicate or write eBPF programs. So I know it's looking like uh, straightforward, but still, uh, you know, there are a lot of things happening in the background. So it's still not as straightforward as we want to, you know, write our own e uh, eBPF programs, but it's getting simpler. So yeah, that's what I wanted to cover. Uh, yeah, with that, I'll hand it over to Anmol, uh, one of my colleagues. So thank you. Hey, thanks, Amrat. Okay, so Samrat gave a pretty good overview of how eBPF works, what it looks on the surface, but sticking back to the idea that we have here, the agenda for the talk, we need to understand how eBPF can be leveraged to have sustainable computing related observability, right? So that's where we need something else apart from eBPF, which can complement the metric surface. And that's where we get to this particular question. We understand what eBPF is, but from where do we get the metrics which eBPF will be leveraging, right? This is where we come across a couple of fundamental consumption tracking or metrics. The first one is the RAPL, which is runtime average power limit. This is essentially there from Intel, which is a hardware level feature, wherein you can essentially have your CPU dynamic RAM related metric monitoring and tracing done, right? The second one is the NVIDIA management library, NVML. Uh, this is essentially there for GPU level tracking. So from these libraries that we see, right, there are some API calls which are getting made. The metrics are collected and consumed by eBPF to form some decisions. This advanced configuration and power interface, ACPI, and the last one, intelligent power management interface, both are there for having platform related metrics captured. So at the node level, you get the metrics for the consumption of energy. So energy can be consumed in form of joules. So that's where you will see that CPU cycles, DRAM, uncore, RAPL related readings are essentially reported in form of joules, et cetera. The CPU cycles, the misses, cache misses, et cetera all are captured as metrics, and those are essentially made available to you in form of Prometheus if you are using a utility which can essentially consume the metrics from eBPF, and we will certainly get to a point wherein we explore that particular utility in this talk, right? The last point which talks about uh, uh, having constant idle power consumption, which is essentially proportionate to the power getting consumed by the containers or pods is essentially reflecting that Power consumption itself is a very vast topic. Idle power consumption is something that will be present on a machine and, and will be idle, will be a constant, regardless of whether any processes are running on the machine, on the virtual machine or not, right? Whereas there is another angle or another power consumption category which is called dynamic power consumption, which depends on how the resource utilization happens. So idle power consumption along with dynamic power consumption, both essentially give you the right set of metrics which you should be leveraging for having the observability from an energy consumption perspective. And idle power consumption is essentially proportionate to the size of containers that you're running. So if you are running 10 containers of different sizes on a particular virtual machine or a bare metal, you will essentially have the idle power consumption spread across proportionately. So here we get introduced to an open source CNCF tool uh, which is called Kepler. This is Kubernetes based uh, efficient power uh, energy tracker. Essentially, it's a Prometheus exporter, okay? So it, it does nothing, but it sits somewhere in your ecosystem. Could be a virtual machine, could be a bare metal. And then it runs an exporter, which requires Prometheus node exporter as a, a prerequisite. You essentially have on the left-hand side an eBPF program generator code written. This is the code that Samrat was showing in the previous slide, wherein a high-level program in C or Rust could be written, and then essentially it gets compiled using CLang or LLVM, and then gets converted to the bytecode, which is suitable for eBPF, and then it goes through the verifier cycle, which was shown in the kernel space. So the left-hand side, the top left, is essentially the user space 
area wherein you are writing the eBPF program. And then this particular program goes ahead and starts tapping on the trace points in kernel, starts tapping on the counters, the hardware counters, the C group, uh, SysFS related stats, etc. And then essentially these counters are reported to uh, a specific box that you see in the center wherein there is some sort of reporting happening. It is compiling some results from even the pod level metrics that you are having. So you are getting the container ID, you are getting the Kubernetes pod ID, you are getting some metadata associated with the nodes. And all of this data gets compiled and some hardware level readings you can essentially take, like the REPL reading, like the GPU reading, like the interface reading that I talked about, ACPI, et cetera. And additionally, if you are using something like Telegraph for capturing power supply, or if you have worked on uh, the deployment kits, uh, DPDK, et cetera, then in that case, uh, you can use DPDK, you can use the power supply metrics to augment this particular data and essentially have uh, registered there so that you can get some enriched data along with the data that you are getting out of the box using Kepler. And once th this is uh, captured, you essentially get the stats in joules in, in the CPU cycles in form of caches, in form of uh, different, uh, let's say, uh, node consumption, pod consumption related energy stats, etc. And all of these are essentially fed to something called as a Prometheus model server. Because when we come to capturing metrics from virtual machines and uh, bare metal machines, bare metal machines can essentially help us get the metrics directly, wherein the Kepler uh, exporter which is sitting can tap on the bare metal and essentially get the raw metrics. Whereas when we talk about virtual machines, it is not yet possible to tap on the real-time metrics of virtual machines, and that's where there is some sort of normalization that you need to do, or you need to probably have some inference taken by using a model which is based on some previous data, or there are some pre-trained models that you can leverage. So there are some power models as well, power supply models as well that Kepler has published, and it is uh, in progress uh, to, to introduce more architecture support. And this is where the learning model here is like a feedback loop which keeps on going. And essentially you have the non-real-time metric related uh, forecast and power supply related information essentially populated and ultimately you get the metrics in Prometheus. And then once you have the metrics in Prometheus, you can plug that into Grafana. And from Grafana you can have the alerting set or you can directly have the alert manager configuration done at Prometheus or if you are using any other utility which has a capability to ingest data from Prometheus like SysDig, et cetera, you can essentially go ahead and leverage that. So uh, I already talked about the pre-trained models. And there are a bunch of things that you will need to do to install this. This is essentially the summary that I uh, gave you in the previous uh, slide itself when I was explaining the architecture. So ultimately, this is how things would look like. And uh, you will be getting uh, metrics like PKG, DRAM, the thermal design, the power supply, and the other uh, uh, metrics. So now we need to understand how to really interpret these metrics, right? Because ultimately, just getting the metrics and having some fancy dashboards is not going to solve the purpose. We need to understand how we can make sense of these. When we train the uh, AI ML models, we essentially get uh, lured to go ahead and try some hyperparameter tuning because it's like looking fancy. Probably we have some data sets. Uh, we want to go ahead and do some experiments with some uh, different split or different configurations, etc or probably there are some new models that we want to train and we are just doing some assembling of the models and then we are trying out which one works best, which one is giving us the performance and accuracy that we desire. So our goal is to improvise accuracy, improvise performance, but then we really forget the impact that the models could be having on the environment. This particular dashboard and the related thing or the session that we are having today is to make awareness that uh, essentially model training or even beyond AI ML, the compute intensive operations that you do are to be tapped into. You just don't need to run behind SLI, SLO, SLAs, et cetera, but also you need to check on the metrics. So now with this, I'll hand over to Mickey who will talk about a specific use case as to how eBPF can be leveraged beyond observability with some different angle associated wherein we introduce how network anomaly detection can be done in order to see uh, what all things are happening wrong with your network because PAR has covered 
that uh, networking inconsistencies are essentially contributing to uh, posing like hindrance uh, to adop adoption of sustainable computing. So we understood at a high level how eBPF can be leveraged to have observability taken or, or achieved. But now we need to understand what all other things we can do or the other areas we can improvise on to have a better uh, sustainable computing practice evolved, right? So with this, I'll hand over to Mickey. Yeah. Thanks, Shammo, for covering the call. Paras mentioned that network poses challenges for sustainable computing. Let's ex explore another angle, not just observability, to see how network anomaly detection with eBPF can help predict issues and take corrective actions. I'm excited to introduce Times FM, a new open source time series forecasting model, and discuss how we can use it with eBPF. Network anomaly detection is crucial for early identification of attacks and outages, ensuring smooth service operation. However, as attacks grow more sophisticated and real-time adaptability becomes necessary, traditional methods fall short. eBPF and Times FM offer powerful new approaches to real-time anomaly detection, helping us catch issues efficiently. This is how AI resolves those issues. We can leverage powerful forecasting model like Times FM to predict the normal behavior of our system. This gives us dynamic thresholds shown here by these upper and lower bounds that adapt to system unique patterns. Can you see that red dot? That's an anomaly, a real issue that needs attention. Because we have those thresholds, we can catch it immediately. No more static thresholds is required. Just accurate, timely alert that help you stay ahead of problem. The advantage of using eBPF to analyze network traffic is that it enables highly efficient real-time data collection because Packets can be analyzed directly in kernel space. Overhead is low, enabling detailed monitoring while maintaining performance. In addition, no context switching between user space and the kernel space is required, allowing flexible filtering and event processing. In fact, traffic analysis combining eBPF and machine learning was proposed and is being used to detect attacks such as hollow fraud, for example. Times FM is a feature and time series model, and its unique feature is that it can be used immediately for prediction without additional training. Times FM applies the concept of large language models to time series data predicting future values without needing specific training. It understands patterns in time series data and predicts what comes next, enabling zero-shot zero forecasting. Times FM is available as open source and is more accurate than other time series models. It outperformed other models in zero-shot forecasting forecasts on unknown data sets, Monash and ETT, confirming that it's capable of making highly accurate and efficient forecasts even on new data. Times FM stands out because of three key advantages, speed, accuracy, and ease of use. It delivers high prediction accuracy comparable to deep learning models with lower, lower inference latency. Unlike traditional statistical models, it doesn't require complex training on or data preparation. 
This combination of speed, accuracy, and ease of use makes Time Sahem a powerful time series forecasting tool for a wide range of applications. Combining Times FM and EBPF makes it possible to detect more subtle network anomalies in real time that were difficult to detect using conventional methods. Specifically, by using EBPF to extract features from network traffic and building a predictive model with Times FM, it is possible to detect abnormal traffic. This will improve network security, stable operation, and early net detection of failure. This is an example of anomaly detection using traffic data for a real application. Which data points are considered anomalies depending on the predicted confidence interval? For example, if the confidence interval is set to 0.95, as in the figure on the left, there, are, there will be two anomalies. On the other hand, if the confidence interval is set to 0.8, as in the right, the number of anomalies considered will increase. As such, it is important to set the confidence interval appropriately in anomaly detection. Finally, let's discuss an example architecture for network anomaly detection using eBPF and Times FM. Network traffic data obtained from eBPF is pre-processed using Google Cloud's PubSub and Dataflow and then stored in BigQuery. After that, time series predictions are made using the data on BigQuery with Times FM hosted on Vertex AI. OK, so let's summarize what we learned today. We should monitor not just resources, performance, and cost, but also the environment impact of running compute-intensive applications whether they are on public or private clouds. Now that you understand how eBPF works and supports observability, explore how eBPF part observability can help you identify actions for practicing sustainable computing. When working with cloud vendors, choose cloud regions and resources that have a lower carbon footprint. Try to optimize your application code and configurations instead of over-provisioning resources. Use auto-scaling of cloud resources whenever possible. These are some additional resources that are worth reading. That's it from my side. Thank you for listening. Yeah, so thanks for listening. Uh, we are up for questions. If you have any, we have about, uh, approximately five minutes. Uh, if anyone has any questions, please do feel free to ask. Yep. So, so for the next word, so, uh, oh. Thanks for your talk. And so I was wondering that, like you, you said, like you can collect the metrics around like a power consumption with uh, with a hardware counter or EPPF or whatever yep. in your in your system, and they like uh, collect as a Prometheus metrics, and you you said that like a resistive alert or something, hmm. then like a uh, say like you detect that the power consumption is say like increasing and like a uh, get the alert, then like a uh, what what's what would be the like a next step you would do in the in the real system? Uh, that's yeah. Sure. Thanks. Thanks for your question. It's a pretty nice question. I'll just repeat the question for the audience. So the question is, we have actually captured let's say the metrics through eBPF and we have now got it on the dashboard and we have got some alert as well which has got raised. Uh, ultimately, we need to understand what we 
do as part of next step to mitigate the issue right so the thing is uh, mitigation on that specific run that you are doing is not going to be possible uh, you are going to require uh, some sort of uh, analysis over these trends that you are doing and understand where in your model or your application code or configurations there can be any optimizations introduced so that the next time when you do uh, any sort of training or if you are running any compute intensive tasks those probably can be optimized for less energy consumption uh, before ebpf also there were some libraries that uh, uh, like Code Carbon was a library that that is still open source and still many people use uh, who are not using eBPF. That particular library uh, you can have added or invoked via SDKs or you can add decorators in your functions and specifically you can go ahead and monitor like you do profiling what energy consumption is there at a function level. Right, So that's where if you think that there are some unnecessary operations getting performed, you can go ahead and optimize those. eBPF, what it does is it doesn't require any kind of decorators, any kind of SDK or context manager related switches or changes to be made in your application. Rather, it will tap on your system calls and essentially for the events you have subscribed against, you will essentially see the metrics getting captured. That's where it's a clean approach wherein you can get the stuff outside itself without any configuration or reconfig need of reconfiguration to the application from tracking perspective. But for optimization, certainly you will need to tap into the application code. Hope yeah, that and, answers your question. And, and to add on Anmol's point, uh, he mentioned about the application code, right? And I don't know if you know about a tool called Parka. So that does uh, profiling of your applications. So whatever Anmol was mentioning that uh, each you know uh, code and whatever function, how much you know cost and all it is consuming, you can get that. So that is one uh, good tool. Uh, Parka is the name, so you can explore that as well. Yeah. Yep, that makes sense to me. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else? We do have three minutes. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I, yeah. I definitely agree. EBPF is the next best thing after sliced bread, right? So regarding um, the when you were running the observa observability, mm -hmm. um, what was the overhead? Did you guys monitor the overhead of yep. the observability you were running? So uh, as such, we don't have any benchmarks to show from our side against this uh, because uh, it's like we run more, uh, this particular stuff against different models. However, there are studies available in market which we can link in the presentation when we upload this to uh, the schedule. Uh, if you compare eBPF against service mesh, wherein sidecars are running, or if you compare eBPF against any other additional, uh, let's say, uh, container that you are adding to tap on the metrics in terms of logging, etc. First thing is that as many pods are there, those many sidecars or containers will be getting created, which means those will be consuming more resources on your uh, platform. The second thing is uh, they don't work at the system call level, rather they are uh, a different set of applications which you are invoking as part of your, let's say, joint operation or transaction run. So that's where eBPF, since it is working at the kernel level, the and and also for one virtual machine you will have one kernel managing across all these uh, transactions the load is as such not really uh, significant it's it's pretty less because uh, if you just go ahead and have a regular run done for s trace on the cat utility itself you will see hundreds of system calls happening just in the cat utility or ls utility itself right so that's where uh, those calls are anyway happening and we are just tapping on those calls to capture the metrics, so the overhead is very minimal. Yeah. yeah thank you. Thanks. Yeah, uh, last question. Hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, I was wondering, like, is there some suggestion on how to capture energy consumption that might be um, delayed workload, like for example, for network processing, um, packets are not processed immediately. Mm -hmm. It might take some time before that happens. Like, mm -hmm. How do you capture that? So as and when, so good question. So the question is, uh, how do we capture uh, 
any sort of metrics corresponding to events that are delayed. So first thing, if the events are delayed or there is any delay in the processing, the system call itself will also be delayed, right? eBPF is essentially tapping directly on the system call. So without system call, your application program will, exec uh, will, will actually not execute, right? So as and when the application is having the system calls at the kernel level getting executed, we are tapping into the system calls and then essentially having the metrics captured from there itself. So if there is any delay with respect to uh, the application, uh, the runtime of the application itself, or if the application is overloaded and there are some delays, you essentially will be having the metrics captured as and when the transaction is getting executed. However, there could be some load in terms of multiple applications being hosted on the same virtual machine, and then uh, you requiring a lot of context switch, et cetera. So that's where there are some optimizations that ideally need to be done uh, to just capture how the performance is uh, kind of uh, uh, to, to be tweaked. So there are perf event open, et cetera, related calls that you can tap into. And then there are some probes that we have. Uh, essentially, when you write your eBPF program as C program or Rust program, you'll need to make sure that you are taking care of those use cases. So it's, it's simpler than writing a kernel module. However, you need to understand how to have the uh, eBPF program written in a manner which solves your use case, and if at all there are any, let's say, uh, null references or dereferences, et cetera, which could crash your memory or which could hamper your kernel, the verifier engine that was showed will essentially reject your eBPF code and you won't be allowed to deploy it. So that's where it's a quicker self-serviceable sort of uh, tapping into kernel and modifying it rather than writing any full-fledged kernel module, but it essentially works the way I described. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, we are done for the questions. Thanks a lot, team. Uh, thanks for being a nice audience, and hope you enjoyed the talk.